I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. Captain Cook, right? Everybody goes on about what a great sailor he was and what a brilliant navigator, but he kept missing really important things, like he totally failed to spot Sydney Harbour, which you've got to admit is a pretty big omission. And then when he came further up the east coast to here, he saw this big lump of rock, which is now called Nobbies, I think you can probably see why, but he failed to spot the fact that just beyond it is one of the most functional harbours in the world, Newcastle. Duh. Seems I've been everywhere in Australia, but not Newcastle. So let's see what we can uncover. How about an Aussie digger who went to war in his pajamas? Who says the British Empire's dead? Maybe you'd prefer a lesson in convict slang. Guns. Guns, yes. Oh, it's a bit scary that you know the answer to that. <laughs> well, there's the night the music stopped and the crowd started. Seconds later. So a city that went from a sail-by on a cook's tour to the biggest coal exporter in the world has plenty to offer. And it starts with the incredible shrinking Nobby's head, that big hill behind me. In the early days of the colony, this harbour was really scary because Nobby's was just an island back then. So the tide used to come whipping in across here, go smack into the harbour. In fact, it was so terrifying that people said that when sailors came into port, their faces were ashen with terror. So in 1818, Governor Macquarie decided to build a breakwater in order to stop the tide using the raw material off Nobbies as the basis for it. Now, this was a colossal piece of work. It took around about 30 years to complete. And the original plan was that they would get rid of Nobbies entirely, but there was such a local fuss about it, such a furor, that in the end they only reduced it from 62 metres to 28 metres, which is still quite a lot, I know. But this is the first recorded example of community activism in Australia. Hooray! So, having saved a lump of rock called Nobby's Head, the locals ended up with a beach which they called Nobby's Beach. I put it on my walk for two reasons. One, it gives me another chance to say Nobby's on the telly. And two, because of a very unusual visitor. Around here, the weather can change just like that, and it certainly did on June the 7th, 2007. There were 56 ships moored out here, all waiting to load up with coal. And as the weather started to get really bad, the Port of Newcastle Corporation radioed them and said, back off, back off, there's a storm coming. And most of them did, but one that didn't was a big ship, massive. 77,000 tonnes, it was called the, the Pasha Balka. By next morning, conditions had become horrific. With no ballast in its holds and its propeller half out of the water, it was an accident waiting to happen. And did it happen? The Pasha Balka was pushed up the coast and then, bang, it stuck right there about 30 metres off Nobby's beach. Now, this could be a major ecological disaster with oil slicks all over the beaches and thousands of seabirds covered with oil. The whole of Australia was focused on this beach on that day. Nobby's Beach Surf Club 
became the nerve centre for the rescue operation. <laughs> Henry, do you get one in for me? Hey, That's Tony. for you, Tony. Yeah, How are you, mate? mate? Cheers, mate. Hey, hey. same, same. Warren, were you on duty as a lifeguard that day? Yes, I was, mate. We were here just watching, basically, for the first part of it all before the real drama really started. But then you went in yourself, didn't you? Uh, myself and our lifeguards got their jet skis together and came out three of our local surfers that surfed the big waves. Uh, on your jet skis? On the jet skis, yeah. They went on for two and a half hours, and that was some of the most scariest moments, not only for us and our skis, but what we watched those, the Westpac rescue helicopter do was just unbelievable. And no one was killed? No one was killed. Everyone returned to shore safely, and they were very heroic, their job, what they did that day. Henry, apart from the issue of the crew, there were about 700 tonnes of fuel on board, weren't there? I'm not sure if they pumped it off or crated it off or how, but they got almost all that fuel off and left us with a very pristine beach. But once the, uh, once the original danger had been averted, it seems to me that the people of Newcastle quite enjoyed this moment of drama. It was the greatest tourism attraction we've had for years and years, and that lasted for quite a while. Uh, you have a look at that beer coaster there. One of our members uh, decided that uh, we could make a few dollars out of those. Made a lot of money for the surf club. Was very, very good for us, yeah. Do you reckon I could pinch this one? Yeah, if you're very quick, you could pinch that one, <laughs> yes. <laughs> good to meet you both. Thanks for your bravery, mate. Even though this moment of high drama only happened a few years ago, it's already starting to fade from the memory of most Australians. Except that here, on the headland, above the beach, there's a piece of the Pasha Balka which has been set into the concrete as a reminder of that terrible day. And it's not this great red curve here, that's just a piece of art. It's this manky, rusty plate from the hull. Bloody ship. Two hundred and ten years before the Pasha Balka gate crashed Newcastle, another unplanned boat arrival kick-started this place. On board was one Lieutenant John Shortland, who'd been sent from Sydney to chase escaped convicts. Unsuccessfully, as it happened. He waded ashore, scrabbled around for a bit, then bent down and picked something up. You know what it was, don't you? A lump of coal. He immediately realised that this was a really significant moment in the history of the colony, and he wrote to his dad that it more than made up for losing the convicts. Pretty soon, Newcastle's first mine, just here behind the breakwater, was churning the stuff out. And in less than two years, Newcastle was sending it around the world. The city's love affair with coal had begun. Here's something you don't see every day, a statue to a piece of coal. It's not exactly Michelangelo, is it? But what it does tell us is that by the middle of the 19th century, Newcastle had vast stocks of coal, and the people around here were paranoid that someone might try and nick it. They even thought that the Russians, thousands of miles away in northern Europe, might sail across and grab it. It was total tosh, of course, but nevertheless, Newcastle decided it needed some robust defences. So they built the terrifyingly named Fort Scratchley. Andrew, come on. You do realise I'm destroying the whole premise of this series, which is supposed to be that I'm doing walks, not pitching lifts. But it is a jeep, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is, mate. Come on, Andrew. Andrew, given that the Russian threat wasn't real, why did they build this fort? Well, I think they were a bit worried that uh, the British were leaving Australia, and I think Newcastle wanted to stand on its own and say, we're as good as Sydney and we could have our own military presence up here. But after all the investment that was put into this place, the Russians never turned up, did they? They certainly didn't. But somebody else did? Yes, they did. The Japanese came in here in 1942. And what defended you against the Japanese? These two Mark 7 six-inch guns. So who actually fired the gun? Uh, Captain Wall Watson was a battery commander at the time and he'd been stood to all night while the attack on Sydney was going on. he just got to bed and the alarm went off that Newcastle was under attack. So he thought it was a false alarm. He ran up to the observation post to take charge, still in his pyjamas, suddenly realised we were under attack, gave the order to fire 
and then uh, command come through and said, you've got permission to fire? And he said, well, tell him I bloody well have. So he did give the orders to fire in his pyjamas. He's probably the only person in the whole of the Second World War. I'd say he probably was. And we are going to lovingly recreate that moment now with the help of the local historical society. Can I join in this, Laz? You may. Thank you very much. Number two gun load. Make safe. Number two gun fire. I have just fired one of the only two working six-inch Mark VII guns in the entire world. Who says the British Empire's dead? Thank you, guys. Thanks for your help. See you. I'm just coming back down from the fort heading towards town, but before I do that, I just want to show you this over here. You've no idea what you're looking at, have you? See where all those cars are parked? That is actually part of San Francisco, which I'd better explain, hadn't I? That's all reclaimed land, and it was reclaimed with ballast from the ships which came from San Francisco, and they, they dumped the ballast there before they picked up the coal. Why was there so much ballast in San Francisco? Well, it was all from the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. So that is really a little piece of Hyde Ashbury. Love and peace. Right, let's head on. Some of us never really left the 60s. In early times, this area, East Newcastle, was home to the oarsmen who manned the port's pilot boats and lifeboats. So I wouldn't have lived here because, as a rower, I make a great pedestrian. Times changed, the pilots slowly moved out, and this became the city's red light district. Also no good to me, because as a prostitute, I make a great rower, if you see where I'm going. In recent times, the place has become, dare I say, trendy. So why the ups and downs? Fish and chips, please. Sure. Thanks. In 1915, BHP, which was and is one of the biggest companies in the whole of Australia, set up a steelworks here. Overnight, Newcastle was transformed from coal town to steel city. Thousands of jobs were created. The money rolled in. But then, at the end of the 20th century, BHP pulled out again. Thanks a lot. Mmm, that was so good. So it's 1999 and 10,000 steel jobs are gone. But that wasn't all. Slowly, the ever-present dust and smog of industrial life lifted. It revealed a city of lovely old colonial and Victorian buildings, not to mention some cracking beaches. Novocastrians have always been a pretty positive breed, and now there was a renewed sense of optimism. As one wag put it, BHP did two great things for Newcastle. It came and it went. Here, here. And now I'm off to Bolton Street in the centre of town. This is exactly the kind of place that you need to explore if you're on a walk through history and you're looking for some rare historical jewels. I know this is just a rather ugly 60s or 70s car park, but look over here. Isn't that pretty? It's called Rose Cottage, and it's the oldest house in the whole of Newcastle, built around about 1828. It's great that it's been preserved and rather beautifully done, I think, but you'd hardly call it accessible, would you? Nevertheless, let's, let's get inside. I don't think there's anybody there. In his early days, it was owned by a bloke called Black Harris, who used to Shanghai sailors. He'd drug them or get them drunk, and they'd wake up on board ship and have to work their passage. He was a terrible villain. But now uh, it's owned by a firm of lawyers. Who, I'm sure, are very learned people. One thing I've learned about Newcastle, it's full of surprises. Whether you're at the beach, going to war, or walking through a car park. What next? Well, the second half of our walk starts right here 
on King Street. It's a bit weird, isn't it, when you're walking through a city and suddenly you start climbing up a steep grassy knoll like something out of Jack and Jill went up the hill. But actually, beneath my feet is the possibility of some magnificent archaeology because this is the site of one of the oldest cemeteries in the whole of Australia. 3,300 bodies stretching back to the year 1802. Sadly, there's no sign of them now, thanks to a typically insensitive 60s redevelopment, when the gravestones were ripped out to create a rest park. I reckon the only things resting here are dead shopping trolleys and bloodthirsty mozzies. But all isn't lost. The council have managed to identify where a lot of those gravestones were originally sited. And as you can see, they're starting to put a lot of them back. And you see that view of the sea over there? Well, you can't see it here or here or here or here, can you? So they're going to cut down as many of those trees as is possible. And hopefully, they'll be able to create a fantastic new vantage site from which the people here can have a look at their city. But what really tickles me about this story is this. You remember I said in the 1960s, all of the graves were completely wiped away, completely destroyed. Well, that's true, except for one, this glorious thing. Who did it belong to? The first mayor of Newcastle and his wife. I wonder what old James Hanell would think of the city now, with its modern quayside developments and trendy cafes. Would he sit me down to share a fashionably small latte or encourage me to harangue passers-by about their local history? Let me see. Ladies and gentlemen, did you know that the first Australian dictionary was written in Newcastle? Did you know that? No. no. Oh, it's absolutely true. You can see how impressed our friends here by, the, <laughs> uh, by that knowledge. It was in the year 1812. Anyone got any idea what a strumpet is or was? <laughs> a lady of ill repute. A lady of ill repute. Congratulations. How on earth do you know that? <laughs> uh, this is a bit, a bit more difficult. What are barking irons? Guns. Guns, yes, pair of guns. Bang, bang, bang. Well, uh, it's a bit scary that you know the answer to that. Um, what is to frisk the cly? Frisk the cly. Here's a clue to frisk the cly. <laughs> <laughs> To, sorry, I just keep big, talking. Big yes, that is to big pocket. <laughs> to beef a man. Sounds fairly <laughs> horrendous. Doesn't it? What does to beef a man mean? Beat him up. It, yes. No, it's the opposite, actually. It means to stop a thief. Now, the bloke who wrote this, this James Hardy Vaux, he was actually uh, a convict himself. In fact, he's the only bloke that we could find who was transported to Australia on three separate occasions. He was such a bad bloke. But he kind of worked with the authorities at the same time. So he drafted this book, which he called The Vocabulary of the Flash Language, which, quite frankly, I think you guys ought to learn. You've shown such a basic ignorance of it, because... <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but if you ever get busted, you won't be able to understand what the other convicts are saying, will you? <laughs> if they tell you <laughs> they want you to beef a man, you're going to be in trouble. Bye. When I was 17, I used to work for a firm of ship's victuallers. I'd got this little Austin 7 van, and I'd drive down to the Port of London, open the back doors, and then I'd walk down a gangplank like this one, carrying great sides of meat and cans of baked beans and tomatoes, and I would give them, and this is the really eerie coincidence, to the cooks on board the coal boats from Newcastle on Tyne, who just come down to London. Well, they used to do exactly that kind of job of ship's victualling in this Newcastle, Castle in the 19th century, although it was much more hectic than I was used to. Uh, they didn't have Austin 7 vans, did they? they? They were called butcher boats? That's right, they had these things called butcher boats. You can see the one here, they're about nine metres long, uh, pointy at both ends, very fast, and they used to row out 
and tout the, their wares to the boats as they arrived. How far away were the ships? Well, as far as 50 miles. They used to go 50 miles down the coast. They're out for 20 hours sometimes. They'd leave at 3 a.m. in the morning. And Why didn't they wait until the ships arrived in port? Well, it was a competitive thing. There'd be big races, and once they got to the boat, they'd be climbing up on the sides and they'd be pulling each other down, and the first one up there usually got the deal. And this is actually one of them? It is. It is a beautiful exhibit. Should we have a look? Yeah. Because you've all been paying attention, you'll remember what I said earlier about me and rowing. So rather than make a total wally of myself, I thought you'd like to watch the lads from Nobby's Beach Surf Club put a butcher boat through its paces. Put your backs into it, guys. It's a me contract we had out there. Smile, you're on the telly. <laughs> The guys who rode on the butcher's boats racing competitions? Yeah, definitely, definitely. They were, they were professional rowers. In fact, Australia dominated the rowing from the 1870s through the early 1900s, mostly through professional rowers like this. Oh, that was slightly more difficult than driving an Austin 7, wasn't it? <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that. It was brilliant. Thank you, Tony. Thanks Cheers. For I've done a bit of research which suggests that Newcastle and alcohol have a, well, colourful history. In the early days, one commanding officer was actually given the old heave-ho when his soldiers dobbed him in for drinking their grog. What a cheek. But the most famous incident of that ilk took place right here in this very alleyway and in this very building. It used to be known as the Star Hotel. It was owned by Tooth's Brewery and they just took the rent, they didn't take the profit, so quite frankly it didn't really matter to them whether the place was successful or not. And eventually Tooth said they'd demolish it and local people were up in arms. On the fateful night of September the 19th, 1979, the final gig took place, the coppers moved in and all hell broke out. Pete, this must have been a crazy place in those days. The craziest. <laughs> uh, so much so that uh, the craziness still lives on 30 years down the track. <laughs> and you were there on that celebrated night and were quite central to the events. Yeah, I was the uh, guitar player and singer in the band called The Heroes and we were the last band to play at the Star Hotel. When was the last time you were here? September 19th, 1979. So you haven't been here since? Nope. Driven past it a thousand times but never been here since. Do you want to come in and have another look? Love to. <laughs> Does it look like you remember it? It smells as crappy as it did then. <laughs> it was supposed to be a, a house of ill repute at one time. Yeah, well, it always had an ill repute, so <laughs> that's in keeping with its history, I think. What do you remember about the night? <laughs> um, I remember that it was a great gig. That's probably the first thing I remember. Do you remember what you were playing when the police arrived? Oh, most definitely. It was a song called The Star and the Slaughter. It was an original song written by the band. So it was written about the pub? That's what everyone said, but no, it wasn't, in fact. What kind of lyrics did it have? The chorus went, well, I want action. I want fighting in the streets. We're going to take this town by storm. We're going to burn the village down. You know, so after the riot, the coppers were going through the lyrics of the song, going, yep, that happened, that happened, that. They must have written that in the band room in the break. <laughs> you, you will probably remember this noise. This, yep. this is a recording of what happened at the town. <laughs> seriously hurt. In fact, if he's not seriously hurt, he's very badly injured. They have tipped over a police car. I've never seen anything like this in Australia. It's just the most extraordinary situation. So you were trapped inside here while this noise was going on out there. Yeah, there were so many people there that you just simply couldn't get out into the street. But then we could hear we could hear this noise going on outside, and it was, it was a roar by this stage. And people were coming and saying, man, it's all going down outside. So we forced our way through the crowd and stepped out into King Street. It just took a moment to recognise what was going on. I saw petrol that was running down the street into the gutter across the road. And the exact thought I had was, if somebody lights that, we're in deep shit. And seconds later, and the flame ran down the street, and there was a paddy wagon parked on the side of the street. That went up as well. And there was a very brave policeman who, only a young guy, and he thought somebody was in the paddy wagon. 
and he raced out of nowhere and unlocked the paddy wagon to see if anybody was inside. Luckily, there wasn't. Why do you think the riot kicked on? The riot took place because it was too much alcohol and too many drugs. Then the Colosseum effect took over. Then the planters just wanted blood. Did it destroy your career? Oh, far from it. Ultimately, it gave us a certain amount of notoriety. And we went on to do an album and a couple of singles, and we supported ACDC on their tour of um, Australia in 1981. So my 15 minutes has lasted a fair while, Tony, I've got to tell you, you know. <laughs> One night, 30 years ago, this whole alleyway was seething with alcohol and anger and drugs and inept policing. And now it's all quiet and it's just a bit of an old dump, really. You've got to love a historical walk that starts at the beach and ends at the pub. Very Newcastle, that. A sense of local identity seems to me to be really important round here. Everyone still reads the local paper and watches the local TV news. And while I've been on my walk, so many people have stopped me to tell me something about the history of the place, always with pride in their voices. Newcastle has changed an awful lot over the years, and since the closure of the steelworks in 1999, it's had to change even faster. And I bet you, if I come back here in 10 years' time on another walk, there'll be a hundred more stories for me to tell about this gutsy, gritty town. Mm -hmm.